Welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Xi. I'm currently a sophomore at UCLA, was elected as the youngest delegate for Joe Biden, and also co-hosts this podcast. And I'm Jill Wine-Banks, the author of The Watergate Girl, about my experience in the Watergate trial and tapes hearing. Uh, I also was an aspiring journalist, so I'm particularly interested in our subject for today, which is saving democracy through local news and other uh, means in a book written by our guest today. People often ask me what the biggest difference between the Watergate era and the current day is, and the most frequent answer I give is that Back in the day of Richard Nixon, when I was prosecuting his top aides, there were only three networks, and they all shared the same facts. We could differ about the policies that resulted from those facts, but the audience all had one set of facts. There was bipartisanship, and it all worked very well. As information came out, Democrats and Republicans both started to not support Richard Nixon. They accepted the information they were getting. Flash forward several decades, and the media has become very fragmented, and we are now all living in silos. Those of you who watch me or anyone else on MSNBC believe a certain set of facts, facts which I consider to be accurate. And those who watch Fox News or OAN believe a totally different set of information, information that I would call um, alternative facts, because that's what it's been designated by the Republicans. And of course, alternative facts are actually lies. They are not facts. There is only one set of fact. And we have to get back to a time when we all share a set of facts, when that is the reality, instead of lies and disinformation, which is what I would call alternative facts. This trend has fueled our distrust in each other, the media, and worse, has entrenched polarization to levels never before seen. Our guest today is Martha Minow, former dean of Harvard Law School, current 300th anniversary university professor at Harvard, and the author of a new book called Saving the News, Why the Constitution Calls for Government Action to Preserve Freedom of Speech. Professor Minow has taught at Harvard Law School since 1981 and is widely regarded as an expert in human rights and advocacy for members of racial and religious minorities and for women, children, and persons with disabilities, as well as digital communications, democracy, privatization, military justice, and ethnic and religious conflict. As Dean of Harvard Law from 2009 to 2017, Professor Minow strengthened public interest and clinical programs, diversity among faculty, staff, and students, interdisciplinary studies, and financial stability for the school. I'm also proud to say that she's a native of Illinois. She graduated from New Trier High School in Winnetka, Illinois, before going to University of Michigan and Yale Law School. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Minow. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It's hard to believe anyone could have the expertise in so many fields as you have. And... uh, you have written, you teach, you've been the dean. It's really quite amazing. Uh, but you have done it all. And there's a lot to cover today. Uh, but I want to start with your book, Saving the News. Um, it's the reason for today's Jill's Pin, which is an old fashioned newsboy. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a news vendor standing on the street selling newspapers. Seemed appropriate um, given the goals of your book. And uh, both Victor and I have read your book and we learned a lot from it and enjoyed it. Um, I thought it would be helpful to start by having you tell our audience uh, just a basic premise of the book and why you wrote it. My pleasure. Uh, I wrote a book called Saving the News, Why the Constitution Calls for Government Action to Preserve Freedom of Speech because we are actually in the midst of a slowly unfolding destruction, elimination of the news industry as conventionally organized in the United States. Uh, That means particularly local news uh, and the news industry, actually the press is the only private enterprise mentioned in the United States Constitution. It's presumed 
uh, and access to this kind of resource is actually necessary to have the form of government, self-government, that's established for the United States. But over the past 15 years, half of the journalism jobs in America have gone away. Uh, most of the advertising revenue that supported uh, newspapers, magazines, broadcast, cable have moved to online uh, social media sites. Uh, and there is a, a really a serious crisis. So I, that's why I wrote the book. Um, I analyze really surprising to me the degree to which the government has been involved in uh, supporting and shaping the media industries since the beginning of the Constitution, uh, from the post office to financing the research that led to the Internet, and along the way, antitrust action, creating public broadcasting, and so forth. I also analyzed concerns that the First Amendment prohibition on government uh, abridgment of the freedom of speech forbids any government action to step in right now and argue quite to the contrary. Uh, there's a lot of room for government action. And then I identify, depends how you count, maybe 11 to 15 proposals of, of actions that, that the federal government could take and state governments too. Um, in the currently pending legislation, Build Back Better, one piece of one of the proposals I have is actually present. Um, uh, an element of the local new sustainability act, um, and there are other possibilities that are very much in discussion in Washington. Okay, and we're going to break down each and every one of those things and ask you some more detailed questions about it. Um, I, I also want to talk about before we get into some of those details. Victor and I both, uh, in addition to reading your book, recently uh, heard you speak at an event hosted by the Adlai Stevenson Center on mm -hmm. Democracy. Um, and Adlai Stevenson Sr. was one of my first political heroes. Uh, I was in, I think, third grade when he lost the presidency. And when, uh, so it's definitely shaped my political uh, interests ever since then. Um, but you were also um, accompanied by your father, Newton Minow, who served as chairman of the Federal Communications Commission under Lyndon Johnson. And the FCC is, of course, the government agency that regulates interstate and international communications among all the media that you just mentioned, radio, television, uh, wire, satellite, cable, um, across the US. And so, I, first of all, I can only imagine your conversations at dinner as a child with a father who was the head of the FCC. And I, it made me wonder and think about you know, did that influence your um, interest in the field that you're writing about in this book? Well, thanks so much for that. And I was, you know, overjoyed when Dad agreed to write the preface to this book, which is frankly the very best part of the book, uh, filled with wisdom and perspective. Uh, and no question about it, having the parents that I have has influenced every aspect of my life, <laughs> including my career and my interests. This is the first time, though, that I've actually written about the news media or the media generally. Um, and so, uh, although I have views and have long uh, studied the subject, uh, most of what I've learned uh, and certainly a lot of the interest came from uh, talking with my dad through the years. So I'm fascinated by the words that you chose um, for your title, Saving the News, Why the Constitution Calls for Government Action to Preserve Freedom of Speech. Um, I, I thought maybe it'd be helpful to start by defining a few of the terms and explaining the evolution of those terms in recent history. So just to begin, um, starting with the news, what did that once mean and what does that mean now? Well, the news, I think, uh, is a word that refers uh, and to the same thing now that it did originally, which is reporting by uh, somebody about events that are unfolding and uh, analysis of those events. Once upon a time, it largely was uh, reports uh, through uh, the printing press. Uh, was the major technology known in 1776, 1791, when the First Amendment was adopted. Um, but there also, uh, over time, started to be other technologies. Uh, the telegraph was one, uh, 
Um, and, uh, and, and when broadcasting started with radio first, uh, and then television, then cable, then the internet, the news it could, it could be carried by any of those vehicles. But of course, all of those vehicles also carry other materials uh, that can be entertainment, that can be disinformation. So how about um, government action? What was government, you mentioned a little bit this, about this in the beginning, but what was government action like in the past and what should it be now? Well, thanks for that question. Uh, as I say, I myself was surprised to see how much government action there has been over time. Uh, the Constitution created a post office. It, uh, in fact, to be quite specific, gave Congress the power to do so on Congress uh, enacted that power very quickly. And from the beginning to the present, uh, it, it, Congress has subsidized the distribution of news with lower rates for uh, media, for newspapers, magazines, and also actually originally free distribution across media sites, news sites, so that there would be circulation of news. And when Alexis de Tocqueville visited the United States in the early part of the 19th century, he remarked that he was just so surprised to see how much the news circulated in this brand new country, that even in um, off the beaten uh, tracks, people who were living in the woods, uh, in cabins, uh, read, uh, read the news, uh, much more so than uh, he was familiar with in France. And people, historians since, have done studies and shown that their per person uh, the amount of uh, publicity, uh, the broadsides, and then early newspapers, many more in the in the United States than in Canada or in England. Um, government action, though, has spread, uh, you know, all the way from the government giving land to the telegraph companies, uh, the government buying up the very first uh, telegraph technologies, to the regulation of broadcast to make sure there is not... Uh, a, a kind of interference in the use of the limited airwaves, the granting of licenses to organize uh, the use of the airwaves with conditions on the grant of the licenses, including serving the public interest, something that my dad talks about a lot, both in the preface and elsewhere. And beyond that, uh, government action has included the establishment of satellite, as Jill mentioned, uh, the launch of communication satellites that actually enable uh, uh, private enterprises to distribute information, uh, all of our cell phones, of course, but also uh, other kinds of expression. Uh, and the government has been involved uh, even in the research that led to the very first algorithm for Google, uh, as well as the design of the Internet, all government supported. The government's also been involved in uh, enforcement under the antitrust laws, at times deciding to break up a communications enterprise or to forbid, for example, the ownership of a newspaper in the same jurisdiction that a company owns a television uh, broadcast uh, license. Uh, other times uh, choosing not to enforce antitrust, which also has a big effect. Um, on what uh, is the shape of the industries that are involved. So I think lastly, the term freedom of speech, um, what do you think that means now, especially with the evolution of the news, as you mentioned, from the printing press to the internet where there's no barrier to entry? Well, you know, I, I have been asked, why did I include in my subtitle freedom of speech rather than freedom of press, mm -hmm. which is the uh, most specific provision in the First Amendment that's relevant to my book. And there, there are a couple of reasons, but uh, not a small reason is that the Supreme Court in its interpretations of both clauses has tended to treat them as very similar and to suggest that the freedom of press is really encompassed by the freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is uh, a, a protection that's given to individuals, but under the Supreme Court's interpretations, it applies to entities like corporations as well, uh, uh, that protect uh, each of us from government uh, prior restraints on what we say uh, and protect us even to, uh, in the right of receiving information. The Supreme Court has said that the freedom of speech includes the right to obtain information, uh, not only the right to speak. 
One of the big questions that's posed by the internet that your question implies, is there something special or something that changes once that uh, we don't need to get access to a telegraph or need to obtain a license uh, for broadcasting? Uh, all we need to do is to log on to a computer and we don't even experience that we're paying anything, even though, frankly, we are. We're paying in our data that is being obtained every time we log in. Um, is, does that change anything about the, about the freedom of speech? Well, one thing that is changed uh, besides this disruption of the conventional business models is that there is an access to amplification, uh, that is greater than ever has existed uh, for human experience. It is currently not uh, addressed whether or not the freedom of speech be includes the right to reach everybody. It never was an issue before. But is there a right to reach everybody? And the reason I say that is that one kind of restriction would be that, that people should be able to post whatever they want, but that does not mean that, uh, to have a right to distribute what they post to the world. Mm -hmm. In other words, the government could create some barriers, some restrictions on how many uh, people can receive the information uh, without uh, potentially violating the First Amendment. But that's un undecided thus far. Could you talk a little more about that? I I'm, I'm curious as to how the government could step in and, and stop people from accessing the information? Well, you know, it's, it's really private companies that have designed and run uh, internet social media platforms. Uh, and so actually they have rights of not only free speech, but also property rights to set up their own rules of distribution. Currently, um, the major uh, internet social media companies have all set up moderation practices. And as we saw during uh, COVID-19, um, many of them have come up with rules to restrict the distribution of fake news, misinformation about COVID, or to amplify more uh, verified information. It seems to me conceivable that the government could uh, require the companies to adopt such moderation practices or to make transparent what their moderation practices are. Thank you, thank you. So uh, let's go to the introduction to your book. Uh, you list three things that have uh, contributed to the current state of news in America. And you talk about the sheer volume of the material, the advertising, and you mentioned this also in your opening remarks here, and divestment in news gathering and reporting which leaves a sizable gap in coverage of the local news. And I wanna go through those three things uh, and, and particularly focus maybe on the local news part, but um, what impact does the volume of material have? We're in an area of basically unlimited data. Well, there's unlimited materials. Some of it is news, some of it is junk, some of it is generated by robots. Uh, some of it is generated by teenagers living in basements uh, trying to make money uh, by gaining eyeballs. Um, but you're right, there's all of us have access to an influx of information material more now than ever in human history. We carry around in our cell phones, you know, access to much of human knowledge throughout time. That's unprecedented. Um, the current experience, I think, that many of us are witnessing of fake news or misinformation or disinformation is particularly troubling. It's not that it's the first time in history that there's been misinformation or propaganda or people spreading lies or rumors. It's, again, this, this amount uh, and also the speed uh, and the ease of distribution that makes it somewhat unusual. Um, so... In, while the justification for government regulation of the airwaves was predicated on the scarcity of the airwaves, 
And many people have argued, well, we don't have scarcity now. The internet is limitless. There aren't inches on a page that require an editor to select what gets uh, printed or not, or what show gets broadcast or not. The, the fact of the matter is there's another kind of scarcity, which is our attention spans and our brains. And that scarcity might conceivably justify some kind of regulation. It certainly could justify some kind of consumer protection. Uh, uh, we do have pretty good evidence from the whistleblower and other sources that some of the social media platforms actually are engaging in practices designed to form addiction, uh, addiction to being online, uh, as well as uh, arousing uh, fear and anger and other kinds of emotions. And in, it has been a role for the government to guard against uh, abuse of human vulnerabilities, especially for young people. Some of the research that shows that uh, Facebook uh, was uh, well aware that uh, more time spent on Facebook by teenagers leads to higher risks of suicide, uh, nonetheless proceeded. That's the kind of concern that could justify government regulation. Excellent answer. And so let's look at the second uh, thing you mentioned, which is advertising and the role that it plays in reshaping news organizations and coverage? Well, advertising has been a major source of funding for news media for a long time. Not always. Um, there was a time in the early 19th century when major newspapers were owned by political parties, for example. Um, and it is still the case that a mix of different revenues support news media, subscriptions, ads, uh, investments, other kinds of activities. But advertising has been the mainstay for a long time. And that's why the migration of advertising dollars away from news gathering organizations to the internet has really decimated uh, the ability of, of news, legacy news uh, organizations to continue to reinvest in gathering the news. One thing that we know for sure, and this is a local news point, is that when uh, news operations disappear, it, empirically, it's well uh, established that corruption increases, both by government and by companies. When news gathering and reporting disappears, political participation declines in a local community. And two uh, the stories that I report in the book that really affected me, uh, in the instance of Michael Brown's murder uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, investigated by the Department of Justice, which showed that the reliance on the local courts on fines and fees imposed on poor people to support the court system contributed to a lot of the problems uh, with policing in that community. One of the other findings there was that there was no local news. So there were these abusive practices unfolding with no one watching, no one reporting, and that was a big problem. The other story actually is about Flint, Michigan, where public health officials exposed the lead in the water that was seriously damaging uh, people, and particularly children. And I had the chance to talk with a public health official who blew the whistle on that practice uh, that grew from government decisions uh, about the water supply. And she said to me, you know, actually, we were lucky. And I said, lucky? What do you mean? She said, well, we had good local news. She, and then she said something that I really can't get out of my mind. She said, there are hundreds of Flint, Michigans around the country, but they're not being exposed because there's no local news. Wow, that, that is answering a question we haven't even asked yet, which was about the importance of local news, something I recognize as having grown up in Chicago where we used to have a lot of newspapers. Yeah. Morning, afternoon, evening, we had them all. Um, but let, let's look at the third point that you make in the introduction, which is, the divestment from news gathering and reporting and the impact that that has uh, on society and democracy. 
Right. Well, thanks. Well, because uh, most news organizations have fewer resources with the decline of advertising and loss of subscriptions and so forth, and because the Internet companies, even when they uh, print or allow the distribution of reports from legacy media organizations, they do not reinvest in news gathering and reporting. So that virtuous cycle of a return on investment that gets plowed back into further reporting, that's broken now. And, uh, you know, the, the loss of people's jobs, you know, the, the a actual elimination of journalism jobs. You know, I, I'm following what's going on in Chicago very closely as the Tribune bought by a private equity company, immediately buyouts to the journalists, many of them award-winning, and they are, uh, that's, that's a big city newspaper. And we know in many small towns, half of the towns in America um, have at most one, new, one news organization. Many have none whatsoever. Um, and that's, uh, uh, that means that there's a real loss of investigation. It means that when the city council meets, there's no reporter. Uh, at this moment, uh, when when uh, state legislators meet and, and enact legislation or fail to enact it, if there's any reporter in many, many states, the only reporter is a student reporter. Um, this is the government's business. Um, I heard a report that so troubled me that in uh, the New York uh, boroughs, in the criminal courts, there are no reporters. There's no one covering what's going on. Um, it affects thousands and thousands of people, and no one is uh, is is taking uh, the role that the press has played of ensuring accountability and making sure that nothing terrible happens because someone is watching. So um, in your book, you write that the authors and voters behind the First Amendment thought that the press was important enough to single it out as a distinct bulwark for the liberty of the people and their vision of self-government. That part was so striking when I read it and also when I heard it earlier um, in this conversation. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the role in the, of the press in the First Amendment and why it's significant? Thank you. You know, the people who wrote the Constitution were all revolutionaries, Right. So they knew uh, very well and firsthand the role that uh, printing presses and early newspapers had in uh, developing support for the revolution in the first place and then for the Constitution and its amendments. Indeed, the copies of the Constitution, the copies of the Bill of Rights were made available to the public by being printed. Uh, as the backside of newspapers or uh, with the help of the local printing presses. Um, and so, in fact, you can look at the uh, comments, at the letters and the statements by the founders of the United States, and they all talk about the significance of the press to uh, what they had done, but even more to self-government, that in order to entrust the governance of their affairs to their fellow citizens, the fellow citizens needed to be informed. Now, let's be clear, initially, and for a long, long time, much too long, uh, the voting right was restricted in the United States and limited to property people and then just to white men. Uh, and uh, it took a lot of struggle to expand self-government to really mean the entire community, although children still don't get to vote. Um, but during those struggles all across American history, the media has played a critical role in the struggles themselves and then enabling self-government along the way. I mean, it's truly remarkable. What are some of the biggest challenges to the press um, in our history? And I'm wondering if the attacks on the press by Trump was worse than in the past, including President Nixon. It's an awfully good question. There have been challenges uh, throughout American history, you know, we're, we're, we're governed by human beings and they're flawed. So there was the Alien and Sedition Acts in the early days of the early republic when uh, the political parties that were never contemplated by the framers, kind of hard to believe, uh, became so vicious with one another that a new party was elected and then turned around and tried to imprison members of the old party. 
Uh, that was a, certainly a restriction on freedom of speech. Um, and for most of the 19th century, indeed, all of the 19th century, federal courts provided no avenue for enforcing the First Amendment. It didn't give individuals access to court to object. And when it when people did object, for example, to prior censorship, they, they lost. But starting in the early 20th century, that began to change. Um, and uh, the, the restrictions on the speech of, for example, labor organizers, restrictions on the speech of uh, political opponents, one by one by one were struck down by the courts over time. Other times, though, where there have been some real challenges to speech, you know, incurred the Red Scare when uh, Senator McCarthy uh, charged a lot of people with being communists and people objected that this in interfered with their freedom of speech. And some of them faced uh, really serious sanctions, loss of their livelihoods and so forth. Um, President Nixon did uh, indeed uh, describe the press as, uh, as an enemy. Um, and so have some other uh, political figures. President Trump, though, may be right up there as a major uh, uh, opponent of the media. But let's be frank, President Trump treated anyone who had any claim to authority, uh, any ability to check his power as an enemy, it's actually the playbook of tyrants all around the world through history to name as an enemy anyone who has uh, any competing power, and particularly the media. And we see this right now in countries around the world where democracies are very much in jeopardy. I'd say, thankfully, we have a president now who respects the press and the job that they have in our society. But how badly do you think that Trump I guess, damage the credibility of the press and its perception to the public. You know, even this phrase, fake, fake news, was popularized by President Trump and the argument that any information you don't like is fake um, is now very prevalent. I think that the biggest danger at this moment is very linked to that problem, that uh, that any news report, whether it's about COVID or vaccines, um, has uh, plenty of counter reports and has eroded people's confidence in information uh, so that the very uh, technique of having truth come out by more information is in jeopardy, a technique that was celebrated ever since the Enlightenment uh, in Europe. And, you know, the Enlightenment in Europe, the development of respect for science and for self-government and for toleration for different religions. That was hard fought after 30 years war uh, in Europe. It really took a really a hard development in society and culture to, to come up with those ideals. And those are all in trouble right now. So for me, as someone who was an aspiring journalist, of course, I'm upset by the loss of so many journalism jobs. but. Uh, also, as someone who was a reader of multiple newspapers, including all my local newspapers that used to exist, um, I, I, of course, found very disturbing your description of what's happened to local news, but also as a member of the board of the Better Government Association, which focuses a lot on open meetings and freedom of information and transparency in government. And, and I think you've really identified in your earlier remarks uh, the answers to the questions I was going to ask about, you know, what are the damages that we are suffering as a society because of the lack of local news? But I did want to give you a chance if there was anything else you wanted to Our ability to vote and to participate in our civic society. For example, you're in a community where you can't get your city council meeting reported on. You don't know what's happening. Well, you're you're quite right, and thanks for your role in in uh, in trying to make the government processes work. Um, the ideal image of a town meeting where everybody attends is uh, seldom true. Most of us don't have time to attend, and so we rely on reports from others. 
uh, to know whether there's something happening that, that is troubling and that will affect our, our votes or our other kinds of ways of expressing our views. You know, you mentioned the Freedom of Information Act, you know, a powerful tool that requires uh, access to materials generated by the federal government. Many states have similar uh, uh, practices so that um, there can be accountability, so that if uh, there are decisions that are being made or data being gathered or misconduct, um, it can be exposed. Uh, the problem is most of us don't have a hobby of bringing Freedom of Information Act requests and without uh, a, uh, a profession like journalists to do this, um, we're in trouble. As a follow-up to your answer, I wanted to ask whether you've looked at how we compare to other democracies in terms of local news. Are we way behind other countries? You know, I think the news industry is in jeopardy in many countries right now. You know, um, the third of uh, the countries that call themselves democracies are now identified as struggling democracies. And in many, uh, again, it's the internet that's part of the problem. You have governments that are either censoring the internet, government officials that are uh, using it in ways that are troubling. Um, local news um, is a, a, a practice that the United States was very strong in, and now we are not. Um, and as to other countries, there's a variable, as you can imagine, uh, different practices around the world. I should say that the internet is a real asset in the sense that citizen journalism is now possible in ways it never was before. Anybody who has a cell phone can take a video and up, upload it and share it, and so we can see Arab Spring uprisings, we can see you know misconduct in the Sudan, um, and that has helped actually the distribution of news in many regions that didn't have a robust news industry. Of course, it also has the negative effect of allowing the spread of citizens with their own viewpoints and no facts behind it, uh, expanding. You're completely right. And you're completely right. And we, we actually, unfortunately, are now living in a time when uh, misinformation or disinformation in India contributes to uh, a violent uh, uh, riot where people die. Uh, similarly in Myanmar, where misinformation uh, distributed on uh, social media sites has led to killings of people. So it's a, it's a scary time. I would have to say in America, the same thing happened. January 6th is all you have to say to know that it happened here, but um, are, are there, yes, there are did. now, of course, fewer uh, print newspapers, magazines. Um, I mean, I remember when there were a lot of news magazines as well as newspapers. Um, does the fact that there aren't so many anymore change how we get the news? Is there an impact on reading print rather than reading online? Or are there some advantages to reading online? Right. So many conventional media outlets um, have started to distribute their content digitally. So where the material is received, whether it's read in print or it's digital, I think is less important than what goes into it. Is it edited? Is it uh, uh, a reflection of the work of people who know something about ethics, uh, the ethics of journalism, the basic rules, you know, have more than one source to confirm information. Don't rely on information by someone who has a conflicting interest. Those are elements of an ethical code that journalists developed in this country, really starting at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and now we have many people claiming to be journalists or people not even claiming anything, but just spreading information and material without any adherence to any norms whatsoever. Um, I think uh, uh, on the plus side, besides the citizen journalism that I described before, you know, there, there could be, we haven't done this, but we could develop better ways to connect with local libraries, for example, to check out a story or to develop other kinds of resources to 
find out um, whether something that's reported is true. Um, unfortunately, then you can have misinformation, disinformation about the fact checkers claiming that they're not true. Uh, they're not telling the truth. So it could be a problem of infinite regress if we don't develop something like norms uh, of professionalism. So I agree with you. I, I would say there is one advantage to reading online, which is oftentimes you can click through in a story to read the underlying source material. Now that, of course, requires that someone have some training in critical thinking skills so that they can evaluate the accuracy of the information they're reading and know what the underlying facts are. But that would, to me, be an advantage of reading online. It's a wonderful point. You know, uh, another advantage is that, uh, you know, you can go to the World Wide Web and, and uh, look behind the stories. Uh, and since more and more through social media, people can get the headlines, the search is for longer form journalism where there can be some kind of in-depth behind the headlines and podcasts and other kinds of new uh, devices are, are beginning to meet that need. But here's a drawback. Um, once uh, we're digitally receiving our material, it's likely to be curated in one way or another, often without transparency, and we are less likely to have the serendipitous experience of reading something we didn't actually choose to read or that doesn't reflect something that we've already been interested in in the past. So the bundling of different kinds of content is something that conventional media did. So you'd see next to the story that drew your attention, you'd see a story about something else that maybe you hadn't thought about, but you know you stumble on it and it's interesting. And now with the kind of perfecting, if you want to call it that, of, uh, of our targeted identities used for advertising and otherwise, we may not encounter stories that aren't something that we've already uh, uh, seen before or on a topic we've already seen before. And I think um, that's particularly problematic where we don't see a point of view that's different than one that reiterates what we already believe. The, the, your last comment is one that I find extremely disturbing uh, in terms of our getting false information from many sources and not having the critical thinking skills to research it and make sure that things are true. Uh, I, I hope that that's something that schools will start doing more about so that we get accurate information. And I agree with you Ed, because we also need to cultivate the desire uh, by people to get uh, reliable information, to use their own critical thinking, to ask the questions, where is this coming from? What am I not hearing? Um, and m more fundamentally, even to cultivate the desire to get information and to be informed and to be informed for democratic citizenship reasons, but in general, to be informed. You know, these days, we really need information about that's relevant to our health and the environment. Um, we need information that's uh, relevant to what's going on uh, for people that are different than ourselves so that we actually come to understand them and come to understand that we share this country, we share this world together. Yes, and I think your point about if you're reading a print newspaper and you're scanning it, that you will see things that are outside your silo of previous opinion mm -hmm. and previous interests. It's sort of like getting a liberal arts education is that you will find things that may interest you that you didn't know you were interested in and that you may learn an opinion that differs from your own and makes you think and question your own. Okay, so we've discussed the evolution of newsrooms. Um, now let's talk about an evolution that is just as, if not more, concerning, and that is the creation and growth of cable news. Um, Jill often tells me that during the Nixon era, all three networks agreed on the same facts, and that's why there was bipartisanship and more accomplished then um, than there is right now. Um, can you first start off by talking us through about how the three networks all gave us the same facts. Was it a set of laws that prohibited them from misleading the audience, or was that just the norm? 
Oh, I think it was a norm, not not laws for sure, although the laws affected the access to broadcast. And so for a long time, we really had only two and a half networks. Uh, ABC only went to half the country. And during that period, there was a, a, the a period of real profits for the companies that were involved, uh, whether they were broadcasters or newspapers. And it's really the heyday of the ideal of objectivity in journalism, really between the 1940s and 1960s, uh, maybe into the, into the 70s. But, um, and it was during that time that those ethical codes really uh, kicked in. And, and the, the fact that there were um, available uh, uh, channel switching so people could see what's going on in the other channel that also contributed to a kind of competitiveness um, I do remember and I've read about uh, this as well the coverage of the uh, presidential conventions a lot of competition by the networks to get it right to get the interviews uh, and that led to improvement of the news industry um, so in the 90s, Fox News came into existence, and they created the business model that many news organi organizations now follow. Can you talk about that business model and tell us if it's har uh, harmful, and if so, why? From what I've been told, uh, Roger Ailes actually was meeting with Rupert Murdoch uh, about the possibility of forming a, a new enterprise, and Ailes had a do-not-compete clause that prevented him from taking a new job with an existing network. He negotiated the term that did, limited it to existing. So he was very interested in the possibility of a new network. And uh, apparently uh, consultants were presenting information and, and Ailes was not happy about it. Murdoch said, what's the problem? He says, well, that's just competing for the same business model, same idea as the existing ones. What you should do instead is go after half the population and don't pretend to be for everybody. Don't pretend to be neutral. Uh, and, uh, and, and Murdoch is reputed to have said, can you make money that way? And Ail said, oh, you can make more money that way. And, you know, the rest is history. I mean, Murdoch already had a successful media empire in Australia and uh, with a lot of print. But, you know, what, what Fox has done is really dominated. Uh, it has more viewers than all the other networks combined. And, you know, we talk a lot about uh, misinformation, disinformation on the Internet. You know, I think that some of the worst uh, misinformation uh, about COVID has come via Fox News. I mean, the other day, two contributors, um, Jonah Goldberg, as well as Steve Hayes, they quit their position at Fox News um, over what Tucker Carlson was promoting over January 6th. And I guess just at that, why are people like Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity and those at the news network able to mislead their audience? Well, you know, I think that um, Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity should not be understood as in the news business. I mean, they're in the opinion business um, and they're in the hate business also. Um, and I think, unfortunately, there have been many reputable journalists who work for Fox who are finding it very difficult to continue to do so. It's uh, really unfortunate. Do you think that there will ever be a time when cable news channels will all base their news on the same facts again um, and cover perhaps more local news? I don't know, but it's one reason why I'm so interested in, uh, in competition, but also in strengthening a public internet, public media. You know, at this moment in the country, uh, the most trusted news source in most communities is public media, NPR, National Public Radio, and that's across the political spectrum. Uh, politicians uh, of both parties are eager to make sure that uh, their stories are covered on public media. Um, and in fact, this focus on local news is also an interesting point on partisanship. Local news historically is less partisan and it's more trusted than national news. And I think we can understand why most local issues don't have a kind of national partisan dimension. Is the snow being plowed? 
Is the garbage being collected? Is there lead in the water? These are daily uh, issues, and it's not about what a national party is uh, trumping up at the moment. Um, but the decline of local news media means that there's less of a shared resource. One reason that there's bipartisan support for local news uh, sustainability efforts is that, again, people in both parties rely on local news. It's what really impacts people at home. It's the same thing when they talk about their local alderman rather than their senator. They have a much sure. more personal relationship yes. and a, they see the results. If, is their garbage picked up or not? They know. Um, Absolutely. But all right, we'd, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask about social media, because for Victor's generation, that is a way they get their news and communicate. They think they're having conversations when they talk to their friends through social media. Um, and you write in your book, and I'm going to read this. It's a quote. Rather than coming across a variety of stories and viewpoints, individuals receive materials reflecting their past interests, predictions of interest, based on their demographic purchasing and viewing habits, and nudges into content that will keep them on the site, even if that content is inaccurate or extreme. And this is something we sort of have been talking about in terms of what you miss by not having a print paper in front of you to get you to see viewpoints that are different than yours or information that's different than you already believe. So how does social media change news coverage and the ecosystem? You know, the fact that you and I could be sitting next to each other with our devices and put in the same kind of question or go to the same link and we'll get different information because there are algorithms that are tailored to each of us. Uh, similarly, you know, if we're on social media, we have our own group of friends and people say they trust information coming from their friends more than from a, a, a professional news source. Um, but their friendship network is a limited group. Um, and so all of that has contributed to what some people call the echo chamber, that we are increasingly living in, in, in bubbles, the filter bubble, uh, where we only see material that is tailored to us. Um, I, it's not just Victor's generation. Uh, Reuters did a survey and found that around the world, two-thirds of the people who participated in the survey say they get some or all of their news from social media. All right, that is interesting. Have we had any studies that show whether this is harmful or helpful? Well, we first have to come to some agreement about what are measures of harm and what are measures of help. Uh, I, I do think that the public health uh, indicators like suicide ideation, thinking about suicide, is a real concern. And we do see that the more time that a teenager spends on social media sites, the more likely they are to, to have low self-esteem and to even think about suicide. So there's some real problems uh, before us. Are there any ways that we can regulate social media companies? Um, should that come from Congress? and? I, in the same context, I want to ask about something that I remember, which is the Fairness Doctrine, which used to require that if a licensed holder of the part of the band that was available and was given to someone, in exchange for that license, you had to agree that you would have two viewpoints. And I'm not talking about the stuff that's going on in schools where you have to have an alternative opinion to the Holocaust, for example, I'm talking about if you have a Democrat on, you have to have a Republican and vice versa. Um, so is there anything that can be done on social media to guarantee that there is a more balanced set of information being put forth? Well, I too am old enough to remember the Fairness Doctrine. It was one of those conditions on the licenses given to broadcasters, radio or television, uh, as a way of serving the public interest that when there were political matters or controversial matters, the broadcaster had to make uh, time available for someone with a competing view or right of reply uh, to someone who was a politician. Um, it, it was never uh, eliminated as unconstitutional, uh, 
But the Federal Communications Commission ended the Fairness Doctrine largely on the view that it was no longer necessary with the rise of cable and even more the Internet, giving many, many, many options for multiple viewpoints. There is an issue about false equivalency. We see this with climate change or with uh, whether or not tobacco causes cancer. Um, there are industries of fake science that have been developed in those areas and in others as well. And unfortunately, uh, journalists and others sometimes think, well, the way to be fair is to get somebody who's a climate change denier or a tobacco cancer denier, and that's the way we get a competing viewpoint. Uh, that's not what the Fairness Doctrine was about, and I think that um, it, there's a perfectly uh, good way to sort through those kinds of problems. Uh, is this a reputable scientist? Is this a peer-reviewed study? Um, there are no peer-reviewed studies that uh, question the human contribution to climate change, for example. Um, and there's a wonderful book uh, recently this year, Jonathan Rauch, called The Constitution of Knowledge, that explores exactly those questions about how do we come to know what's true and what are the practices in science and in journalism and in other fields. Um, and I think we should uh, return to those kinds of guideposts. There's a danger with the government, though, dictating what guideposts there should be or what knowledge is real, um, I, except in this most uh, neutral way that I guess I referred to before, that the government could require social media platforms to uh, make available uh, whatever curation practices they're using, to create choices for individuals. Um, to uh, actually give people the option. Do you want to see a competing viewpoint? Um, I mentioned in the book a group of undergraduates at the University of Chicago uh, created as a project something they called flip side that gives people the opposite side or the competing viewpoint, you know, with the rise of uh, various uh, 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 programs to actually read content. It's not too hard to do that. And while I am sure that the undergraduates there, as well as at your school, Victor, are perfectly talented, I have no doubt that the engineers that are employed by Facebook and some of the other companies have even more talent and experience and could develop such tools if they were required to do so. I think that there could be some other kinds of regulations to explore besides uh, what you might call an awareness doctrine, making people aware of the material that's been curated or the options to see competing points of view. Consumer protection rules, rules about fraud, um, rules about defamation. One of the strange phenomenon in the United States right now is that social media companies are exempted from the rules that apply to legacy media. Um, whether it's the New York Times or a local newspaper or a local television, uh, they're governed by rules like uh, against uh, defamation, against fraud, um, uh, but not the social media companies. They're uh, given an immunity by a statute uh, by the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, because in the early days of the Internet, Congress thought, let's create a free space so that fledgling companies can get their legs. Well, those fledgling companies are now among the largest in the history of the planet. I don't think they need that immunity anymore. Uh, and one interesting set of ideas suggests if they really still want that immunity, which apparently they do, how about making it conditional? They can get the immunity if... And then you could fill in the blank with conditions like they agree to make transparent how they are curating information, or they actually take up some duties to be an information fiduciary that guarantees that what is being distributed has been vetted in some way. Um, there are lots of possibilities there, including requiring the internet companies to allow competition over the curation practices. Um, all of which would be lawful. One of the things that concerns me, Martha, is what social media does to attention spans. Is that conducive uh, for journalists and 
ensuring that people will spend the amount of time they need to get the accurate information? You know, it's an interesting point. Um, there's a sociologist I know, Kiku Odato, who did a study before even the rise of the internet that simply showed that broadcasting and cable had shrunk the length of the average news clip, the average soundbite is the phrase, um, by half or more. And this is before the internet. Um, there are studies that are being done of young children that show there are attention span issues for children. On the other hand, you know, as we've already talked about, there seems to be a growing thirst on the part of many people for the kind of long form journalism that's now available, mm -hmm. for example, in podcasts um, or a series. And so I, I wouldn't uh, count people out too soon. I think that people's curiosity uh, and need to know is persistent. It's hardwired for us. Um, and if we can make more resources available, I think that uh, there will be an audience. I like your optimism. Thank you. <laughs> um, so one of the interesting things that you write in your book is that there has been a longstanding belief that government involvement in regulating the press um, undermines the founder's goal of a free press. But is there an equally important problem now with the government not preventing domination by a few companies and not preventing disinformation and propaganda? Well, that's very much my concern. And while the risks from government censorship are very serious, and I think we have to be vigilant against that. We see this happen in other countries at other times. Uh, it's something that we must guard against. On the other hand, the language and the conception is that the government must not abridge the freedom of speech. That doesn't mean that the government can't is stopped from amplifying from enlarging freedom of speech, hence public broadcasting, subsidizing uh, journalism, creating tax uh, incentives to support journalism, um, and uh, using structural regulations like antitrust or public utility regulation. Those are all perfectly lawful and within the wheelhouse of the government. If the jeopardy from inaction goes all the way to the possibility of destroying democracy. The Constitution is not a suicide pact, as several uh, justices have said, and it should not stand in the way of a government action to strengthen the news industry. So at the end of your book, you list some amazing solutions to ensure free speech and a free press while also um, ensuring that the press does not harm democracy by, by promoting disinformation, misinformation, and lies. Are there any maybe top three that you want to walk, walk our audience through? Well, thanks. Uh, and thanks for the kind words about it. Uh, I think that there are really three categories of proposals that I have. The, the first is to treat the internet uh, uh, social media companies as responsible actors uh, and uh, don't give them an immunity that others don't have require them to pay copyright uh, where they violate uh, the copyright of others the same way we require of others. A second uh, category is consumer protection uh, and protecting individuals from the harms of uh, abuses. Um, all, of course, mindful of the need to guard against government censorship. And the final one is to to expand the range of more reliable news sources, which includes uh, through public media, through subsidies to profit or nonprofit media, and also uh, in, in line with Jill's earlier comments, support for critical media education, critical thinking generally. I think that all of those are lawful and uh, there's a basis for government action in each of those areas. Well, to learn all of them, um, we encourage our audience to buy the book, which I know, Professor Minow, you have a copy of if you want to show our audience. It's uh, Saving the News, Why the Constitution Calls for Government Action to Preserve Freedom of Speech. Um, I, I just have one last question that I usually like to ask for my generation. Um, what advice do you have as a law professor for law students or um, people like me interested in going to law school someday? <laughs> 
Well, uh, thanks for all these good questions. And uh, if you have any interest in law school, I would love to recruit you to law school. Uh, my advice is uh, to, uh, to pursue your interests, to develop critical thinking. Don't go to law school directly from college. Do something in between. There's, the law school is a long time and a lot of money, so you know, have to be there because you want to be there. But most importantly is uh, to develop your curiosity and your knowledge of American history, of economics, of psychology, uh, and to be someone interested in, in questions. The questions are more important than the answers. Uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing pursuit uh, as we try to aspire to achieve justice. I think we're going to be fighting over recruiting Victor to our alma maters, but um, <laughs> what can I say? That was great advice, especially about learning how to do the questions and to mm -hmm. think through. Mm -hmm. I think law school is the process of getting the answers. How do you analyze and get the answer? It's great for you any know, career, not just for lawyers. You are completely right. And you know, when I was dean, I had the chance to talk with many alums who don't practice law. And I would always ask, you know, do you use your law degree? And to a person, yeah. people would say, use it. I use it every day. Mm -hmm. And in ways that uh, it, we could uh, imagine in terms of critical thinking and problem solving, but also ways I hadn't imagined, such as learning how to organize material and then reorganize yeah. it on a dime, mm -hmm. learning how to ask good questions, learning how to navigate institutions, uh, learning how to listen. Uh, and learning how to tolerate competing viewpoints, uh, all very, very good uh, abilities cultivated uh, in law school. We can see why you were successful as a dean, as a professor, and now as an author as well. So thank you so much for being with us today. We really enjoyed it. We hope our audience will go out and read your book and enjoy it as much as we did. Thanks, Martha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching this episode of iGen Politics. I hope you enjoyed it as much as Jill and myself did. And we hope to see you next week for another episode of iGen Politics. In the meantime, follow us wherever you follow your podcasts or on YouTube. And be sure never to miss another episode by following us.